G'day, I'm Richard Morris from Canberra, Australia. In 2014, I was very sick with complications from type 2 diabetes. After taking the dietary advice of the Australian Diabetes Association, I became more diabetic. (laughs) Don't! (laughs) I did some research which led me to the ketogenic diet. Spoiler alert, I reversed my type 2 diabetes by drastically reducing my carbohydrate intake and increasing my consumption of healthy fats. Of course you did. Yeah. In 2016, I was determined to help my buddy Carl by showing him what I did and the science behind it. Hey, y'all. That's me. I'm Carl Franklin from the United States. You know, I used to also be a type 2 diabetic, but not as severely as Richard. I devoured all the information Richard sent me. And after a mutual friend went keto to address prostate cancer, I also went on the ketogenic diet. And that was in February of 2016. By April... I was in full swing ketosis, reversing my diabetes. We're not doctors and we don't give medical advice. We're just a couple of dudes on the internet who reverse their diabetes by following a ketogenic diet. Right. We just want to share our experiences Mm -hmm. and what we know about the science behind the ketogenic diet. Yeah. So we started this podcast to chronicle Carl's journey and to provide some solid information to those curious about this dietary lifestyle. Way back when. Now we have, this is episode 208. Wow. Wow. And some of these episodes have been downloaded hundreds of thousands of times. Nice. Yeah. And after failing on Facebook, (laughs) we moved our online community in a big way. We moved our online community to the ketogenic forums where tens of thousands of people share their experiences. Mm -hmm. We also founded an annual ketogenic festival called KetoFest. Carl and I are both software developers. As such, we found ourselves at software conferences several times a year, and we tend to gravitate towards those conversations that happen in the hallways of the conference. Sure, the talks are great, but it's the community that we enjoy the most. Hey, our guest, Dave Feldman, is also a software developer. He is. Yay! (laughs) So he he knows what we're talking about. But KetoFest, we wanted it to be a conference to discuss the latest research on ketogenic diets, Mm -hmm. but it's also a festival celebrating the ketogenic lifestyle. So, Carl, tell us, what is a ketogenic diet? Well, let's see if I remember correctly. uh, (laughs) It's a diet where instead of burning sugar and starch for energy, our cells preferentially burn fat. And that produces molecules called ketones water-soluble molecules that our bodies use for fuel. Right. Our primary molecular fuels are glucose, which we make from carbohydrates, and fatty acids, which we make from fat. Our cells have two modes. In one, they burn glucose and make fat, and in the other, they burn fatty acids and make ketones. But you don't have to eat a high-fat diet to be ketogenic, right? Well, when you're starting out, you may have to, but then in a few weeks as you become better adapted to burning fat for energy, when all of your calories come from fatty acids, the amount that you need to eat becomes coupled to satiety, which integrates not only the variable amount of energy your body needs to run every day, but also the amount of fat that can be drawn down from storage. And that's a wonderful feeling. Yeah. So how many carbohydrates do we need to restrict ourselves to? In order to get to that state? Well, it depends. Some of us who are metabolically disordered need to get below 20 grams a day. Somebody who's quite metabolically flexible can probably eat as much as 100 grams a day. What about like protein, minerals, and essential cofactors like vitamins and essential fats? Well, you need between 1 to 1.5 grams of protein for every kilogram of lean mass. And beyond that, you just waste excess by turning it into energy instead of using fatty acids. As for the other essential nutrients, if you're eating fatty meats or eggs plus leafy green vegetables, you'll get most of those because those organisms that made those foods have already concentrated essential cofactors. Yeah, and ketogenic diets are varied and delicious. Yeah. They can be vegetarian or carnivore, home-cooked or takeout. Hot cuisine. Hot cuisine! (laughs) (laughs) Or, Or just bacon and eggs. As long as your carbohydrates are low enough. Hey, and if you're an absolute beginner, check out our Starting Keto podcast for more information at start.2keto.com. Well, I'm really excited that Dave's here, but before we talk to Dave, Mm -hmm. I want to know how you are. How how have you been this last week? Uh, Two weeks, Richard. It's been two weeks since we talked. Well, yeah, I'm still in lockdown, and uh, lockdown is due to – we're supposed to end next Friday – um, we're oh. still getting about 15 cases a day, uh, in a population of 400,000. So we being Australia, uh, we being, yeah, the Australian capital territory, which is the province that I live in. Oh, so wait a minute. So Australia completely isn't locked down or is it just 
Canberra. Right. So there are each state. This is the nice thing about it. Um, uh, that, well, what this is one advantage we have in Australia um, that you guys don't have in in the states. You ha- constitutionally, you you are not allowed to bar one state from another. The interstate transport, uh, interstate commerce, um, is 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 mandated. Whereas in Australia, we can compartmentalize our states one from another and mm. so we have borders between our states and you can't travel from one border to the next and actually that's not a bad idea <laughs> i think i'll raise that with my local congressman <laughs> so for example western australia hasn't had a case for uh for quite some time now and they have absolutely no restrictions you can't go in or out of western australia unless you hmm. um uh, you have an exemption and you apply for an exemption you have to basically Go into a quarantine hotel for 14 days to travel yeah. from one state to another or, um, you know, they're, they're, and get tested. And, you know, they're, there's, there are certain restrictions, but Western Australia has no, no problem. So isolated, they're, put, they're doing perfectly fine. We had been 400 days without a case, um, when we got yeah. our first case about, uh, a month ago. Um, mm. and, uh, New South Wales right now is, it's, it's gone epidemic in New South Wales. They're getting 1400 cases a day. You know, wow. 10, 10, or, uh, 10 or 12 deaths. Where are these cases coming from? Because the, the country is locked down. Isn't one it? person. So here was the thing. One it person. Came from one person. And now they, there's 1,400 new people every day uh, are com- uh, uh, getting this virus. And it was a, a limousine driver driving or, you know, a high car driver driving a, 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 a flight crew. For I think it was it was one of the trans, one of the transport carriers like FedEx or someone like that taking yeah. the flight cr- crew from their plane to the quarantine hotel that they had to stay in, um, so that they weren't out in the community. He wasn't vaccinated. He was required to be vaccinated, but wasn't. He got it and mm. gave it to his family. His family Do gave you know it what? to people. They the kids gave it to people they went to school with. It got out into the community, and it just shows you you just need to be. Uh, unlucky once. <laughs> yeah, I think you told that story a couple of weeks ago. But yeah, man, that's that's amazing. I had no idea. I mean, when last time we talked, it was like under a hundred cases. Wasn't yeah, it? yeah, yeah. It was. Uh, I think it was one hundred and fifty cases um, two yeah, weeks yeah. ago when we spoke, and now it's fourteen hundred a day. So, I mean, the, wow. the, this particular this very one of the things that's important is that we testing a lot. So we are testing mm. tens of thousands of people a day. Uh, in each of the states, um, yeah, yeah. I think I think uh, we in in the ACT, even with fifteen cases, we're we're seeing all of the cases because, or almost all of the cases, because we're testing so thoroughly. So, um, and we're in the process of vaccinating. I mean, that's that's the the nice thing. In the ACT, um, the chief minister the other day said that ninety five. So, sorry for for those of us who don't live in Australia. What's ACT? The Australian Capital Territory, which is kind of like okay. DC. It's kind right. of like, you know, it's where Canberra is. It's where the capital yeah, city Canberra is. Canberra is the capital of Australia. Yeah. So it's in the ACT, yeah. like Washington, it, DC. It, Got it. It's a territory. It's not a full state. So it doesn't get us, right. you know, it doesn't have the, it's like, like DC doesn't get a senator. We don't get, um, so, uh, our own statehood. Right. So anyway, um, long story short, the, um, the chief minister, uh, basically the premier, the, the gov is like our version of a governor, uh, mm-hmm. of the, of the state. Uh, had a press uh, release the other day where he said that 95% of the population of Canberra has either had two vaccinations, so they're fully vaccinated, one vaccination, so they're partially vaccinated, or have an appointment for their first vaccination. So okay. within the next month. So within the next month, 95% will have had at least one, assuming everyone shows up for their, their appointment. So we are really coming on coming ahead in leaps and bounds. But, um, yeah, so uh, I'm in lockdown and everyone's going a little bit crazy in lockdown. Of course, it's September 10 here. So, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, that's, uh, yeah, September 11 was a tough day for me and Jules. And so, sure, um, yeah, no. you know, so we- You were you in know, New York. Yeah, we were in New York. And we were, you know, 100 metres away from the buildings when they came down. So, um, so that's a little bit of, uh, it's 20 years. It's been long enough to be able to get over it. But, you know, the, it, it, I, I, uh, you never get over it, really, right? This is, this is the one day of the year that I feel like a New Yorker. So, yeah. Yeah. Good for you, man. So, uh, how, how are you, Carl? How's your week been? Oh, it's been pretty good. Uh, I got to tell you about uh, a couple of things. One is um, 
you know, we don't take advertising revenue mm-hmm. on this show. No, we don't. Right? We don't. We don't have advertisers. We don't do product placement like you see on most television shows these days, where you see brands. However, every once in a while, something comes along that that we partake of or whatever mm-hmm. that we have to talk about. Chicken soup flavored keto chow is that thing for me. So as you know, I've been using keto chow to curb my cravings and, uh, you know, try to stay on the straight and narrow as I'm trying to get back from, you know, pandemic land. And as a lot of people are doing, I think, uh, and the strategy has been working really, really well. Nice. Like, you know, I am dropping weight. My blood sugar is in control, Mm -hmm. but every once in a while, you know, it's like, you know, I have to stay up late. Like for example, tonight. Yeah. Sorry about that. uh, (laughs) It's 1am my time. (laughs) It's no, it's 3 p.m. your time, Richard, uh, and yeah. it's 10 a uh, 10 p.m. Dave Feldman's time. But this is how we have to work. But yeah. you know, because this is a global world. Mm-hmm. Anyway, um, the other night I made a, a a bowl of chicken soup flavored keto chow with unsalted butter instead of heavy cream, which is a tip that I got from Chris Bear at Keto Chow. Oh my God. <laughs> it's good, huh? <laughs> it was so good that even my wife, Kelly, loved it. Yeah. And she would have eaten She's half a picky the bowl. Eater. <laughs> She's a. That is it's an understatement. <laughs> understatement. She basically doesn't like anything with flavor. Yeah. Right, honey? Okay. <laughs> yeah, she doesn't like anything with flavor. So, so you know, I, in our wedding vows, I vowed to feed her. You know, do you, do you promise to love, cherish and feed her? And I said, yes, that was in our wedding vows. And she's, her vow was, do you promise to love, honor and do his laundry? <laughs> and she said, yes. And because Little I'm did not either of you know how difficult these two jobs would be. <laughs> no, no, no. For her, it's there fine. is regret. I, I tried to do laundry once and oh, I was yeah. banished You're from banned. ever trying to do laundry again. <laughs> and this is not something I was used to because for my first marriage, I did laundry every day because mm-hmm. I had to. Mm-hmm. When I was a kid, I had to do laundry mm-hmm. every weekend, mm-hmm. like to the laundry laundromat with yeah. big garbage bags full. I've been doing laundry my mm-hmm. whole life, but now it's like, hey, t- I'm doing laundry. <laughs> You're feeding me. And then I found keto and she was like, I don't like any of this crap that you eat. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, buy me some Cheetos and Triscuits and make me a grilled cheese sandwich. You <laughs> All right. Yeah, well, anyway, long story short, she loved the keto chow chicken soup flavor. And she said, next time, you know, make some saute some mushrooms and buzz them up and put that in there because she likes my mushroom soup. But anyway, um, yeah, especially at night, like, you know, if you're if you're having those late night cravings and you want to go to Burger King or Wendy's <laughs> or whatever, you know, that makes some of that chicken soup. Man, it's so good. All right. So anyway, that's that's not the real story. The real story is I had two dinner guests tonight. Uh, Greg and Susan, I don't know if they get, they didn't give me permission to talk about it, so I'm not going to use their last names, but they came to Keto Fest in 2018. Okay. Um, he was diagnosed with type two diabetes. Uh, and I want to say he looks like a Tofi now, Mm -hmm. but he was 55 pounds heavier. Right. You know, when he was diagnosed and he had just seen his father go through a horrible, slow type two diabetes death. Yeah, it's not good. The last thing they were going to do was amputate his arm. And he said, nope, just let me die. And we, we had a discussion about, um, you know, how, and we've talked about this on the show before, how doc, your doctor doesn't tell you, it doesn't even hint at the end story. Well, for it's diabetics. A, it's a it's a horrible story. It really It's you know, a horrible I mean, story and they don't want to tell you. And they're hopeful that maybe this won't be your Yeah. outcome. But, but they yeah. ask you, you know, are your toes numb? Uh, you know, what what are you doing? And then they give you more medication, but the fact is they don't know they don't know what to do. So basically, they were passing through town yeah. and they emailed me and said, you know, hey, we came to Keto Fest in 2018 and uh we'd like to you know, we're going to be in New London on this night. Maybe we'd like to get together. And I said, well, you got to come over for dinner. Nice. Come on, right? <laughs> yep. <laughs> of course. Of course. And, you know, 
Uh, and that's a, a, an invitation to any keto peeps. If you're passing through my area, just contact me and come over for dinner. I love hearing from you and I love, uh, I love the community and one on one. It's even better. So I made, uh, beef ribs, smoked beef ribs and I made an Asian, um, ginger, sesame, soy kind of sauce with uh, citrus and, uh, and my secret base is Gatorade Zero Fruit Punch. Ooh, you're kidding. I know. You, no, that's I'm horrible. Serious. No. No, no, it's not, it's not that horrible. <laughs> but it, it, it forms a good fruity flavored base oh, for a, okay. for an Asian sauce. <laughs> I'll All take right. your word. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Judge me. Go ahead. Judge me. Yeah. Okay. I get it. Um, by the way, Richard Morris is the best keto chef I've ever met. No, so. that's not. Robert Ramsey's pretty, pretty damn fine. Uh, no, I mean, no, dude. No, yeah, I'm sorry. That, that garlic yeah. sauce that he, he showed me how to make for that lamb. Whew, that was yeah, something I mean, else. That was out of the He's good, but, but dude, come on. Well, come thank on. you. You too. Well, anyway, on. um, the story is that they came to dinner and he basically said that he and his wife were changed fundamentally by Keto Fest 2018. Okay. Wow. That they had never had the experience of being able to go out on a town, go to a restaurant, and not have to explain themselves uh, about being ketogenic. And, you know, they walked into the guard theater and there was coffee and heavy cream everywhere. And, right. you know, usually they have to battle for heavy cream, <laughs> like mm-hmm. little things like they felt like, oh, I'm among my people. Yep. And I don't know if you remember what the theme was, but it was grow your community. That's right. Yeah, it was. I mean, the whole idea was, you know, the universe is creating new diabetics at a linear pace. And That's right. the only way that we can outwit it, we can beat the universe, is to grow the solution right. at a, a exponential rate. So every yeah. that, pay it forward. That was that's the only way to do it. Well, pay it forward was twenty seventeen. Grow your community was twenty eighteen. It's sort of You're sort right. of the same idea, but it was we were really urging people to become influencers. Hmm. Yeah, and they did. Oh wow, how yeah. good! And he actually ended up writing two letters to the American Diabetes Association and getting them published nice. over two magazines, two, their monthly magazine, you know, split over two months. And so he felt like he made some inroads there. They started doing Zoom consultations, mm-hmm. you know, of people who are interested in the ketogenic diet. Um, you know, his success story is, you know, my father died. I saw what happened. I didn't want that to happen to me. I went ketogenic. I, I, I reversed my type two diabetes yeah. and now I want to show everybody else how to do that. So he's, he, he it really touched me because yeah. we, here's a person and we talked about how do you know how many people that you influence? Yeah. You don't. Somebody yeah. could be listening to this podcast or, but forget about the podcast. You could, you could be at a party and you will have dropped 50 pounds and somebody will say, Hey, what did you do? And you say, well, you know, it's not about the weight. It's that I was type two diabetic and I reversed it. And they, yeah. and, and they may, they may, uh, push back because mm-hmm. a lot of people, when they hear the information at first, it's hard, you know, it's, it's like a call to action. It's almost like a threat. You yeah. Know, so challenge. But, yeah. Yeah. It's a challenge. Right. But after a couple of years, you see them and they're like, whoa, whoa. Mm. That, what did you do? Well, I, did what you yeah. told me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, so, that's that was, a wonderful story. Isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It, that was my experience. And that happened tonight. And by the way, the ribs were amazing. <laughs> <laughs> if you say so yourself. <laughs> All right. So we've wasted a lot of time here. We're boring uh, Dave to tears. <laughs> I know. Dave's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, Dave, uh, the next section has a little bit to do with you. And that's the section that we call. Richard, you get the last word. <laughs> okay. So this is from the forum and it literally happened four days ago. Mm-hmm. So this is a brand new post. And uh, I'm, I'm thinking Dave might want to get in there and talk about it. But this is from uh, a user named Turducken2. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That, that implies it was a Turducken1. <laughs> 
and it didn't go well. <laughs> and it's a duck. <laughs> <laughs> there are three of them. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Turducken 2. We don't mean to make fun of you. We're seriously, it's just kind of funny. All right, so here's Turducken 2's post. And uh, the, the title is Why Lipitor? Okay. Recently diagnosed with type 2 diabetes about four months ago and started keto to keep my blood sugar in check. Currently taking hydrochlorothiazide. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yep. For hypertension, which is now under control, but not to the point where I can go off medicine, uh, as well as metformin. Blood sugars are great. I'm 37. I did a cholesterol panel a month after I started keto and the results were not great. Mm -hmm. Low HD. I'm sorry. I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing because I kind of expected that, mm -hmm. as did Dave and Richard. Low HDL, high LDL, high trig, but lower than the initial lipid panel, but not overly high. And in keeping with what I've read about doing a lipid panel so soon after switching diets, mm -hmm. I just went for a follow up with my doctor and my doctor wants to put me on Lipitor for my cholesterol. I think he means well, but isn't on the keto train. Fine, whatever. Knowing that if I got a new lipid panel, the numbers probably would be different. Mm -hmm. I asked if I could wait a few months and see what I could do with just diet alone. The doctor said yes, but also said it was standard protocol for people with type 2 diabetes to go on a statin because of quote unquote unknown factors. Oh dear. I asked what that meant, and he told me the dark humor joke of the cardiologist and the endocrinologist standing over the corpse of a dead patient. The cardiologist says the patient died of a heart attack, and the endocrinologist bemoans the fact that the patient's A1C was perfect. That didn't seem like a clear answer to me. Uh, I did some reading online, and I get the sense that Lipitor has, uh, quote, heart protective effects, unquote. That sounds to me like an un quote unquote unknown factor. <laughs> yeah, right. On. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. In other words, we have no freaking idea, but they say, I'm actually not sure what that means. Mm -hmm. Reading keto websites really scares me because of the side effects that people report with statins, like wasting away, liver damage, muscle pain, and all that. I know this is a biased sample set, but is really making me wary of taking them. But at the same time, I'm terrified of doing some real damage if I don't. I put on a good face, but honestly, I'm mentally exhausted since being diagnosed. I'm pissed off about COVID and getting diagnosed as type 2 diabetic was just the ultimate F you from the last year and change. I'm tired of doing research about medicine and worrying that I'm going to die at any moment from a heart attack or other diabetic complication. Keto makes sense. It's easy to follow and for the moment seems sustainable. But I'm so upset that I can't get a clear answer about the statin stuff. If I get my cholesterol numbers under control with keto, does that mean I don't need the statin? Do I need a statin? Am I going to die of a heart attack if I don't take it? Is there evidence supporting not needing to take statins that doesn't come from a YouTube video? Sorry for the rant, but I'd appreciate some input. Or advice. And I just want to say, um, that this is the kind of stuff that people share on the ketogenic forums. And if you're not a member, go to forum.2keto.com and register. There's a couple of good answers there. And, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to read them, but Paul, uh, Paul L, the old Baconian, who is an administrator, who's awesome, by the way. He is. He uh, answers a lot of um, people's questions, and he says some thoughts. First, if you haven't done so already, check out Dave Feldman's site, www.cholesterolcode.com. It has a lot of information about cholesterol on a ketogenic diet. And then he talks about some of the stuff that you've been teaching us, Dave, over the years. And uh, and then somebody else chimed in. But this, I think, sets up our talk with Dave quite nicely. And so, Dave Feldman, how are you? So good to finally be seeing you guys once again. The boys are yeah. back. Yeah. And uh, as Thin Lizzy said, so eloquently. Yeah. To answer that question, and it's an important question, I need to first preface, once again, I don't give medical advice. 
particularly when we're talking about going on or off medication. Right. But it's, of course, the, the question we're all interested in is the precursor to the going on medication, which is- Right. What happened before? Right. What What's led you to decide to do it? Well, it's the assumption that is the, you know, the medical presumption right now. Uh, 99% of doctors around the world would say this, that yeah, high LDL is bad in every context, that there's no, there's no escape context. There's no high LDL population that is not at a high risk for cardiovascular disease. And so they think, yeah, well, and to be a good scientist, we don't know what we don't know until we can actually yeah. go and get clinical data, which I'm kind of teasing a little bit and teeing up for later. Mm-hmm. We, right have to go a bit off of anecdotes. And granted, there are a lot of anecdotes now within the low carb community that have supplied some degree of uh, what we're being informed by, but they are still anecdotes. I still want to get clinical data. But getting yeah. back to lipids in general, there are some things we do know that I think everyone should be aware of that is already in the literature. One, if you are actively losing weight, that's going to impact your lipid levels. Yeah. I myself tell my friends and family that I would prefer they not pay too close of attention to what their lipid panel looks like when they are right. not yet weight stable. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure yeah. Get Richard, <laughs> yeah, you've been, you've been going through not just biochemistry, but I see that you're working a lot with uh, especially the bilayer of mm. cell membranes. I'm sure you're, I'm sure you're aware of this. Adipocytes, especially as they're shrinking, it's not like their molecules just get closer and closer together. No, In order to no. shrink a membrane, you have to shed its parts. And that includes, by the way, phospholipids Black and free protein. cholesterol. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so you're going to, you're going to end up naturally trafficking more of these lipids. Forget about whether you're even fat adapted or not. You're going to traffic more of these by sh- simply losing weight. And there's In already plenty words, of literature shed. on that. That's yes. what you mean by traffic. Well, they're going to come out of your fat cells. Yeah, I, I would. It's and into your bloodstream. Yeah, I would say sh- shedding is overlaps with trafficking because, of course, it's going to. But usually, when I'm saying trafficking, I'm talking about um, carrier proteins being involved, especially when we're talking about lipids. Okay. Uh, it, so that that can have some overlap with your now weight stable, and maybe you're yeah. powered a lot more by fat. You're potentially going to be trafficking more of those lipids in your bloodstream because you're now powered by it. Something you guys said at the beginning of the show, yeah. Uh, yeah. As I'm as I'm sure you're aware of, we love to talk about ketones, but I know you guys know I pound this drum a lot. <laughs> Unfortunately, one hundred percent of our fatty acids that we're making use of for energy are not all broken into ketones. In mm-hmm. fact, our in fact, arguably. We're powered more by fatty acids uh, than we are by ketone bodies. Ketone bodies are absolutely something our liver is breaking down and making use of, especially for the brain. For the but, brain, yeah. But particularly below the neck, our skeletal muscle, our cardiac muscle, they love fatty acids. And our, yeah. and our heart in particular, this is something I didn't know before. Our heart in particular loves fatty acids coming off of lipoproteins. Hmm. It actually loves the big, the big tankers of fatty acids that come on board. Yeah. Not just okay. microns, but also um, the LDL. Uh, VLDL. Yeah. Mm. So high so anyway, LDL, if you're losing weight, might mean your your heart is happy. Right. So, so to bring it back to the question, he didn't specify exactly what numbers he had. Right. Just that he had high LDL, uh, high triglycerides, and uh, low HDL. If it's a he. Yeah. It, it's not quite clear, right? We'll, we'll call them they. Turducken they, too yeah. is they. Yeah. But this is kind of important because I think that this is a commonality we see. A lot of people, a lot of people have the same story. A lot of people will say, "Hey, I'm actively losing weight. My HDL hasn't shot up yet. That often is one of the latest. Um, this this is also includes my colleague Siobhan. Her HDL didn't go up. It took like three, four years, I think, before it was yeah. finally. It started in like the 30s and ended up finally mm. in the 50s. Mm. Uh, but same thing, triglycerides were higher. Triglycerides are usually the first to start kind of coming down. Don't be surprised if it's somewhat higher, especially when you're actively losing weight. 
Right. And yeah, LDL can sometimes get a little bit higher. It does depend on how, on how much of a metabolically challenged state you were in to begin with. But a lot of people who are especially obese and especially very severely type 2 diabetic that are going on keto actually typically don't see the kind of hyper response that, uh, let's say, gets a lot more of the headlines <laughs> where it's right, yeah. an LDL and say the 300 or 400 milligrams per deciliter. That's usually more uh, for people who tend to be thinner. Mm. Uh, but that said, you know, we need to first see how much of this comes back to what I'm interested in, which is what I think is more metabolic fat adaptation. I think some yeah. amount, as you guys know, that I talk about all the time, high, high levels of LDL, high levels of ApoB, at least high as we would think of them normally, really just being due to more trafficking of fat within the body. And we need to find out how much this really does associate with risk. Yeah. So, so Dave, I realize this is an hour show, but there are some things we want to revisit with you because it's been a while since we talked about the Feldman Protocol. Um, I'd, I'd like you to briefly explain what the Feldman protocol is and how you, how you stumbled on this, uh, this phenomenon and maybe the keto fest experiment. You could touch on that and then we can move on to your study. Sure. So, so can you just back up a little bit and tell us about the, your, your great discovery? I, I call you the Galileo of your lipids because I don't know of anybody else who is, um, talking about the phenomena that you uh, you have discovered. Uh, well, I, I, first of all, that's very kind. Uh, I will say that I'm piecing together a lot of what's already in the research. To be fair, so there is a lot that I would I would defer to some degree. But yes, to the extent to where I feel my own experiments and a lot of what I've observed with the low carb community could be explained by this model that I like to call the lipid energy model. I'm now more confident than I was before. And you guys have been there since the start when it was right. fairly basic. Uh, the Feldman right. protocol was my first demonstrations of being on a ketogenic diet and with a ketogenic ratio of the food that I was consuming, which is to say the food itself was relatively low carb. Mm -hmm. uh, I would consume a huge amount of it and it'd be somewhat and unintuitive that consuming a huge amount of saturated fat could result in a reduction of total and LDL cholesterol. But that's what I kept demonstrating over and over again. Right. Then in 2017, we had Keto Fest and I managed to talk a bunch of people, including both of you guys, mm -hmm. into doing uh, about a couple dozen of us. We all for three days consumed a high level of saturated fat over Keto Fest, which turns out to be super easy to do. Because Keto Fest is, <laughs> it's, it's a Keto Fest. Fest. It's saturated. Right. Keto Fest is saturated. Pig roast. <laughs> Just saying. So I, I think, I think Carl was like number three person ever to do the, the Feldman protocol. And I think I might have been in the top 10. I might have been oh, like no. around I don't, six or I don't think so. Yeah. It's the other way around. Uh, actually, Richard, you were one of the, I think one of the top six, something okay. like that. Okay. And Carl, we did yours coming into that year, coming into yeah. 2017. Yeah, I was late to the party. But uh, yeah, learned learned a lot since then. So I had, at the time, I'd kind of presented it as, well, look, you're trafficking more chylomicrons, the, the lipoproteins that come from your gut, relative to the VLDL, the ones that come from your liver. Mm. And the chylomicrons that come from your gut, they get cleared faster. And the ones that come yeah. from your liver, they're primarily from stored fat. They get cleared slower and they mainly get remodeled to LDL. That would be like the elevator pitch as to why consuming a lot of fat would result in it. But I'm going to go ahead and explain this a little bit more. Explain it. So I'm eating a lot more fat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In my gut, it needs to package that fat and send it on its way into my body right? It makes these gigantic boats. The boats, their job is to carry lipids because lipids don't swim well in the bloodstream. The bloodstream is water-based. Fat and water don't mix. That's right. Now, the genius of the body is that it takes all the lipids your body wants to have and puts them in these same boats. And that right. and cholesterol ride shares with the fat you're using 
in these boats. It's in the same Uber. It's right. And, and <laughs> Richard probably knows this. It turns out that it has to come standard in all of these boats because it's actually important for its structure. It is. Yeah. You actually need, you need these cholesterol esters. I didn't know a lot of this in the beginning, but once you get those into the bloodstream and we're going to skip some of those parts, we're going to keep it simple. Yeah. Then very quickly, your body will start your in, in the periphery and, you know, throughout your body, it'll start picking up a lot of the fat you just brought in. Most of it from that meal, most of the fat that's on board these gigantic boats is actually getting picked up by your fat cells, which might sound bad, but it's not. It's good nah. because you're, you're primarily powered by fat and your fat cells all around your body are actually little, they're like little grocery stores that are available for the neighborhood cells, right? And the nearby. boats are LDL, right? The, the boats are lipoproteins. We got to lipoproteins. Just, the whole class. LDL is a lipoprotein, but there are others. Okay. And an analogy here is the fat cells are like a Tesla power wall. And the, the energy coming in is coming through your solar system, but your house isn't running directly on the energy coming into the sol- through your, through your PV panels. Richard, your house I think is running 25% off the- of our audience knows what a Tesla solar okay. power wall is. Okay. Then I'll, <laughs> I'll shut up. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's good, but can you find it well, more? Uh- so, so an, a, a simple way of looking at this is that, um, that, that, the uh, fat cells are like your car battery and your generator is the, f- the fuel coming in and it goes, mm. the energy goes into the battery and then you use the battery, you use the energy from the battery to run your radio and to advance your spark and all these, yeah, all, the, yeah, all yeah. the other uses of energy. So you're not dr- running directly from the, from the, f- the fuel coming into your body is not going straight to your cells. It's going to your big buffer, which is going to hold on to them and release them on demand mm. as required. So it's a way of sort of smoothing out the the intake. So your car battery s- is like a fat cell. I'm going to slightly slightly correct Richard a little bit. I'm going to say it mostly goes to those fat cells. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are there is some direct delivery, particularly in in moments of high demand. Uh, right. But but getting back to the Feldman protocol. So what's happening? Well, when I'm consuming a lot of fat, mm-hmm. it is true that a lot of what's incoming is signaling to the body, and I'm going to skip a whole lot of stuff that I've since learned about in the last few years. There's a lot of cascading signaling Mm -hmm. Hmm. that's telling the body, hey, we're in a state of abundance. It's time to store. So Hmm. they're going to take up a lot of the fat that I'm eating. And Hmm. also a lot of the fat that was already in circulation, they're going to pick up, including, including taking up the boats themselves, they'll take up the VLDL and the LDL Mm -hmm. that came from the liver and they need to, because something that I mentioned a little bit earlier about cells shrinking, if they need to, if they need to shrink, they need to shed. Well, guess what? If they need to grow, they They need need to to acquire. acquire. Exactly. And so Mm. I certainly believe, and this hasn't been discussed as much in the energy model before, but I certainly believe a big part of the protocol, the Feldman protocol, isn't just that you're storing a lot more of the triglycerides from what you're actually eating. But on top of that, you're putting demands on your fat cells to Mm. grow, to accommodate Mm. that higher payload. And therefore, they Mm. have to take up. There's a lot of fat cells that are literally, it's called endocytosis. And they're taking in the lipoproteins and they're actually pulling them apart to make use of those pieces to put into their, into their bilayer. I know I got a mm-hmm. little bit geeky there, but hopefully you were able to follow me, Carl. You're, you're our proxy. No, yeah, for I, a- I, I, I'm barely hanging on. Trust me. All right. Good <laughs> enough. <laughs> but I know, but I know that your graphs were amazing and you showed essentially that the more saturated fat you eat, the, the lower your, LDL is. And if you invert the graph, right? Because you did blood tests like every day. If you invert the graph, it's almost like one to one. Right. Yeah. Under very it's controlled uncanny. conditions, I can I can effectively set my total and LDL cholesterol. I, yeah. I have my metabolism mapped enough to where I thought about even doing it as kind of a challenge at some point, but I have to have my life under more controlled conditions for me to get back to that 
So, so that we got to talk about your study, Dave, because this is big news. Um, you've been wanting to do a, a really, uh, professional, uh, clinical trial for a long time to, to sort of prove the Feldman protocol and, and other things that you're doing. So tell us about this. Yeah. Basically, you're already familiar with this phenotype that I call lean mass hyper responders. So yeah. <laughs> to kind of set up a little bit, hyper responders is a, term that predates me coming into this, which was just sort of applied to people who we see high cholesterol going on a low carb diet, they have this hyper response. Well, I was very interested and still very much am in this triad, as I call it, where you see not just high LDL, but also high HDL and low triglycerides, of course, both of those being associated with low cardiovascular disease risk. Well, lean mass hyper responders have very, very, very high LDL, very high HDL, very low triglycerides. And I wrote an article in July of 2017 about it. And I thought that they were more common than people thought. I didn't realize they were way more common than I thought. That's mm, wow. to date the most commented of all of, I think we have over 500, 600 comments on that one article Jeez. in cholesterol code. And so pretty soon I started thinking, you know, this is really the key to everything. Because right now I can't even have a conversation with the lipidologist about my work, the graphs that I was, that you were just now talking about. I, I can't even show that to a lipidologist because the moment they see an LDL hovering around 200 or 300. Yeah, they shut down. Yeah, the conversation just doesn't go anywhere from there. So even just to get the conversation started and to be fair to, you know, to understand where they're coming from, it's, it's almost like, we're having a discussion on whether you should be drinking mercury, right? Like it's, it's, right. For, it's <laughs> from their perspective. Why would, why would anybody have a high saturated fat diet if they're seeing a corresponding increase in their LDL? Right. So this population isn't the kind of population I was talking about before that comes from a place of greater metabolic challenge. These are the folks that are much more athletic and lean mm. and often have yeah. no cardiovascular risk markers. Save the one of interest, which mm. as a scientist is exactly the scenario you want. You want to take Everything out all the confounders. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Now, for about a year and a half, I sought to raise the money privately. I actually partnered with uh, Brett Shear for a while. We were trying to just find any way we could to get the study going and uh, couldn't do it. And then eventually about two years ago, actually, next month, I think, I I got it in my head to just go to the community and ask to see if I could crowdfund it. And I I, I have to tell you, I was scared to death going up on stage yeah. and just straight up asking for it because I really thought there was a decent possibility that, you know, I might just get a few hundred dollars or something and then look like an idiot. Because I, I didn't in, just that ask. That was in Denver, right? That was at the local in conference Houston. in Denver? Oh, no, Houston. that was in Houston. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And so I, I – bear in mind that – you guys are technologists, mm -hmm. a Kickstarter, they'll tell you, don't even consider asking for something more than say 50,000. And that's usually right, with wow. some kind of product or event ticket or something right. that you get, mm -hmm. right? You know this because you guys do Kickstarters for, yeah. um, yeah, for, um, Keto Fest. Well, I not only said 50,000 is the floor. <laughs> Like I need a minimum of 50,000. I said, I'd really like it if I could get 200,000 because it's probably going to be 2000 per lean mass hyperresponder. And I want a hundred lean mass hyperresponders for and this study. Just, just for the record, just to clarify, you, you basically are looking for a correlation between lean mass hyperresponders and what? No, no, no. Let, I'm, I'm just about to that point The okay. what I want is I want to study this group I want to get what's known as a CT angiogram. Okay. A CT angiogram is a basically simply stated, it's kind of a scanning of the geography of their um, cardiovascular system. So we're, we're okay. literally looking on the inside of their heart in a, at a high resolution and yeah. all of the vasculature, uh, particularly the arteries around that area mm. and isolating and identifying all plaque presence. Okay. Doing that at day zero, and then we were going to do it five years later. Okay. 
So, Dave, you've got the uh, 100 people coming in and they're all going to get a, 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 a CT angiogram and then you're going to wait for a year and they're going to get a, get a second CT angiogram. And what's the treatment that's being done uh, in between these two measurements? Yeah, and you actually kind of jumped ahead a little bit in that I didn't get a chance to mention, it, but you did see the study design. We thought it would be five years. Right. We now know that it could be one year because our principal investigator is the very prestigious Matt Budoff, who ah, has over nice. 1,200 papers to his name. Yeah, he's the guy you uh, want. <laughs> he, he is. He is the guy. We, wow. we were so excited that we got him, but he uh, he's the one who – showed us a lot of data from existing studies that no, for the effect size, if this is considered a high risk population, they already have longitudinal data on high risk populations. The, the plaque volume progression should be very noticeable at a population right. level. Okay. And so you're looking at the, for, the increase in, in atheros, atherosclerotic plaques based on these people being at a high LDL over a period of time. Yeah. And the period of time, as it turns out, can be one year. We thought it needed nice. to be five years, but it could be one year. And so between those two mm. CTAs, CT angiograms, okay. they will, uh, the participants will have a keto mojo generously provided by, by keto mojo, the, the devices and the strips. Nice. Everybody will test, Excellent. you know, on the morning uh, throughout that year so that we can also confirm that. And uh, there'll also be a midpoint call that the Lundquist makes that like further checks in on them as well. But then um, at, at each end, at each point where they're scanning, they're flying to Los Angeles. Um, it was something that I wanted to do that beyond just getting their scan, I'd actually like them to check in in the afternoon uh, or evening just before and get a good night's rest mm -hmm. in, the, in a hotel nearby that's like our study hotel. Mm. And uh, then, yeah, everybody gets it in the morning. I've learned a part of why I really wanted to press for that with this study is I've learned enough about metabolism to say that I really would just prefer that we have as much controlled as we can for all the participants coming in. In fact, I'm even trying to land it at about the same time in the morning for everybody and more importantly, for themselves when they're yeah. coming back for the return visit to do the same thing all over again a year later. So presumably no coffee, um, a good eight, eight hours of, uh, of, of rested sleep. Right. Well, whatever the hours of rested sleep, I want to get about uh, 12 to 16 hours of water only fasted. As you know, that's a huge deal to me. Yeah. And, uh, and mentioning coffee, uh. you probably already know this. We have found that with some people, there's what we'd like to call a coffee sensitivity. We don't know what mm. it means yet, but we do know some people have unusually high triglycerides that mm. if they take coffee out, they, they don't have high triglycerides anymore. Mm. And it's... <laughs> <laughs> it might be because of the beer they drank the previous night. What do well, you think? for a while we thought that was maybe caffeine related. It doesn't seem to be caffeine related. We know a lot of people on diet sodas and energy drinks, and it doesn't have the same effect. Conversely, mm -hmm. we know a lot of people on decaf coffee yeah. who've tried to go from caffeinated to decaf, and they still see that pronounced effect. Uh, oh, that's a relief, so. I, I like my caffeine. I, I'd hate to think <laughs> that there was a it had a problem. <laughs> uh -huh. I'm a I'm a half calf guy myself. <laughs> Except when I visit Richard, <laughs> and I'm like. <laughs> so so this this I'll is come see the study's only going to take one one year. Uh, well, technically, it could take as much as a year and a half, right? Because we have a recruitment period. Yeah, and we're scanning roughly about two people per day. Mm -hmm. I think we'll we'll meet our recruitment period in say three to four months from when we officially start in booking, and then take mm -hmm. whatever the last participant is, and then add a year to that. So let's say it was four months of recruitment time. Then a year from that is when the last data point comes in. Then, as I know you are aware of at this six, point, six Richard, months to analyze it, write up the results, get yeah, it into publication. It's if yeah, it's not lucky. a it's <laughs> it's not an immediate turnaround. I'll just put no. it that way. No. You usually yeah, right. have some additional analyses. You usually have the uh, publishing process, but 
as you probably also know, it helps to have a luminary as your principal investigator because they kind of know the lay of the land, what the best publication is to put it toward. They already have more of an established record. Uh, hopefully that, you know, expedites things. Yeah. Uh, well, well, Dave, um, we wish you a lot of luck. And, you know, both Richard and I have expressed admiration for your level of cautious optimism that you've always brought to the table in all of your research that you've done. Uh, we consider you a citizen scientist and you've been very, very careful about saying things like, you know, this is an absolute. Um, and we, we get that because we're all software developers here and oh, yeah. we, we've all been bitten by the, this is always true bug. Yes, absolutely. We? Yeah. Well, thank you. I mean, it's look, this has been kind of a fun journey in some respects. It's been a tough journey in other respects. And one of the things that has been tough for me is I have, for the longest time, I had a construct of what I thought the ideal scientist was and thought science in general functioned that way. That there were just a lot of people in particularly nutrition science that was just, that were just anxious and curious about you know, what it is that they could learn that might challenge their existing beliefs. And listen, I, you know, we should be self-reflective. This is both not just outside the low-carb community, but also inside the low-carb community. There Absolutely. is a lot of dogma that emerges, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so at some level, I feel like oh, yeah. you guys talked a little bit earlier about with Keto Fest having themes, particularly in growing your community. Mm -hmm. I would say if there's anything that I hope, mm. I hope that we can all be good examples of is growing your uncertainty. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that absolutely. It, it is too easy yeah, to, it's so our, it's right. our, the human condition, right? right? That we really want to feel we've grokked something, that we've come to understand something to such a level that we can almost just disregard it. And that, that, that part has been answered enough to our satisfaction. And the truth is we should just be perpetually challenging each other and ourselves on even the most core, most presumptive beliefs that we have. And yeah. I, as George Lucas said, <laughs> only a Sith Great. speaks in absolutes. I think ca ca the, the sleep deprivation is finally. <laughs> <laughs> You're probably right. It's yeah. like two no, well said, in the morning. Well said, Dave. It's, it's, uh, it, it, the hallmark no, of I'm science sorry. is uncertainty. Yeah. And, 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 you know, we're, we're, we're looking yeah. for, we're, we're, we're looking at a data set and looking at the levels of uncertainty and trying to match those against the control to see if there's any significance. We're looking for needles in haystacks rather than what, a lot of people think is that we just count haystacks. We're not. We're we're, we're trying to get the the uh, you know a, a, a significant right. result out of uh, out of the data. And and you know I, I I see that you're trying to do that. And and look, it, this is this is your experiment is not so much a hypothesis generating experiment, which is what you do in a pilot study. You know, hundred people, and we're going to try this thing. What you're looking at is refuting the hypothesis that people with elevated LDL have progressive atherosclerotic plaques. And if in you every show, context. In every context. Be, if you can show a context, yeah. all of a sudden now the field is open. Now now all of the scientists get opportunities to find out, okay, what what are these contexts? What, how is this happening? What is the mechanism? So, you know, this study of yours, I know it's small. I mean, $200,000 is not a small amount of money, but in the context of – these kinds of studies, it's a small, it's a small minnow, but it has the potential of cracking open um, a large whale of an idea. So, uh, well done. Uh, couldn't well, I couldn't mm -hmm. be more proud. And let me and, and let me actually yeah, well done you. With all of that prefacing, let me just say, without question, there is the expectation that was placed upon this study and to us that yes, they're just. As I mentioned earlier, there just cannot be a context with where people are walking around with a 300, 400, 500 LDL and not seeing a rapid progression of atherosclerosis given a cornerstone of lipid hypothesis is the data we already see with those people who have the genetic diseases, the, especially right. the monogenetic FH diseases, mm -hmm. where 
Mm. Absolutely. There's the expectation that the progression will be there at a population level. So I'm happy to acknowledge that because we don't have a control group and because yes, it's even if it's one year and even if we should be able to see a signal, we can't, for example, say, Oh, I can feel confident that it doesn't matter what their LDL was. Right. If there's some progression, it could well be that the exact same group of people, if they had low LDL, would have lower relative progression. The 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 bigger question that I'm interested mm -hmm. in yeah. is are we gonna see at least a horseshoes and hand grenades kind of uh uh assessment? Can we, for example, realistically compare it to a low progression group? And say, wow, it's actually within range of a low progression group enough for us to say this is low risk. Yeah. Yeah. Because if it's low risk, even if you want to make the case that there's that slight delta of difference, mm -hmm. that's fine. But there's already so many patients and clinicians that would consider that massive, right? Yeah. There's so many people I know who are, for example, epileptics who are uncomfortable with their high LDL. And they just want to know, look, can you at least put me, say, in, uh, you know, thirds category? Am I yeah. in the top third of risk? Because if you're going to tell me I'm in the bottom third of risk, but it could be slightly more optimal, well, then I'll already take that as yeah. it is. I'll already take a slightly less optimal risk level for not having mm -hmm. seizures, for example. Right. And that, so and that's. And I'm glad that the study will help, at least in that regard. Yeah. Yeah. This is exactly the kind of study that To Duck and Two was asking for, information not on YouTube explaining, making them feel comfortable that at least there is evidence that LDL is not a priori atherogenic. Right. There aren't any. <laughs> you know, this is, this, this, this is going to be the first. And so, um, you know, I, I, I wish you the best of luck and I look forward to seeing the results. Yeah. Well done, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> For as excited as I am about this study, I did want to hearken back to what you were talking about, Carl, in a big motivation for me personally is what I was just now talking about. And I, I realized that there are a lot of people, a lot of people who already had their minds made up about cholesterol. And I know, I know lean mass hypersponders who would you know, tattoo yeah. LMHR on their arm and be like, mm -hmm. this is how I'm living indefinitely. It doesn't matter what data comes out. This study is for the people like who visited you tonight and who ate with you. Because to be fair, there are a lot yeah. of people who are like, wow, yeah. I'm thriving. Everything is so great on keto, everything except right. for this one thing, this one thing. Yeah. But it's a number. It's not how you feel. It's not your health. It's not, it's just a number. It, it, Dave's trying to find out if that number is meaningful to how they're going to feel down the road when they get a heart attack. Right. And that's, that's the stuff yeah. that keeps me up at of, night. Of course. And of it course. has for years now. I've got to yeah. know. But maybe yeah. it is just a number. So if that's, that's, that's what the study, that's what the study, that's what the study is. Hopefully yeah, maybe it is. You're but, right. Maybe it is. Um, the, the having high LDL doesn't always have to be bad right. in all circumstances or contexts. And this is an excellent group to test it in. So well done. Well, it's an excellent group. Yeah. Well done, Dave. And, uh, Hey, we'll see you back here again soon. Okay. Thanks, Dave. I, I always love coming on guys. All right. Thanks. Okay. Now it's time for bullshit. <laughs> so Carl, you know how we have this segment called bullshit. Yeah. B double O L S H double E T. Yeah. Well, we've had some complaints for, from some people about the term. Uh, maybe we should rebrand the segment to something like malarkey. <laughs> malarkey. <laughs> How do you spell that? Well, I, I guess it's M A L and then like four A's and then R K Y. <laughs> <laughs> well, in my neck of the woods, we pronounce that malarkey. <laughs> I'm going to park the car and I'll hear none of your malarkey. <laughs> Perfect. Then malarkey with a silent H. So yeah. last episode on the segment formerly known as Bullshit. Oh, come on. we got to call it Bullshit. <laughs> we spoke it's the about best part of our show, man. <laughs> it's the only uh, – <laughs> we spoke about how when we do a few hours of running on a treadmill and burn X number of calories, that doesn't necessarily mean we burn an extra X number of calories of body fat. Right. It, it it can sometimes simply mean we're going to be burning less in the 22 hours of the day that we're not running on a treadmill. 
Yeah, it's complex and it's complicated. Complex in that the output of the functions are coupled back to the input. So the more energy you have available, the more you'll burn for general day-to-day tasks that the body uses energy for, like maintaining temperature, running your immune system at peak vigilance, making extra enzymes just in case you need them, growing hair, fingernails, all the things that we don't think of when we look at calories out. But it's Mm. also complicated in that each of these potential uses of energy is its own homeostatically regulated process that may share inputs like how much ATP we have access to, technically ATP to ADP ratio, or what the redox state is, NAD NAD plus to NADH, or what season it is, what your fertility state is, what your sex is, what species you are, whether you're a mouse or a man, for example. All of these (laughs) things add to the complexity. Um, and this leads me to the next bit of malarkey, <laughs> engineers doing biology. <laughs> well, wait, wait, wait. We're software engineers, man. Does that mean we're engaging in some malarkey? Well, I'll admit I have in the past, and it's taken me roughly four years of uh, school to learn how to unlearn the habits of a career spent in engineering. See, the way hmm. that an engineer approaches a complex system is by reducing the complexity so you, you end up with just the 20% of inputs that cause 80% of the outputs. It's known as the Pareto Principle, and it's a strategy for reducing complexity in systems that are strongly coupled. So, you know, if you can reduce the number of possible leads that you're going to have to pull to one-fifth of the total levers and get four-fifths of the actual result, then you're heading towards knowing more about how to get the outputs that you want. Hmm. You, you know, that reminds me, Microsoft did a study in the Balmer years and mm. found that 20% of the reported bugs caused like 80% of the crashes in Windows. So yeah. they ranked the bugs by those that caused the most crashes and prioritized the top one-fifth of the bugs. I'll, I'll add a link to that yeah, yeah. in the show notes. The problem is that getting rid of 80% of your crashes may sound like a good bang for Steve Barmer's development, but, but Windows is an incredibly complex system. Those last mm. 20% of the crashes are often the most complex and difficult to reproduce, but they're still crashes. Would you buy a copy of Windows now with 80% fewer crashes? Mm, no. Me either. <laughs> so you know the Latin <laughs> phrase reductio ad absurdum? Right. Reducing a problem by showing how absurd its negation would be. Yeah. Well, in engineering, it's better characterized as reducing and then adding a little absurd. (laughs) So the reason why making Windows not crash uh, is a difficult problem to simplify is the same reason why metabolism and biology in general are a difficult problem to simplify. Windows is multi-threaded. Do you remember what it was like when you moved from single-threaded programming to multiple-threaded programming? Oh, God, yeah. I was doing multi-threaded programming before they even had good models for doing it in Visual Basic. Oh, but dear. <laughs> complexity just goes up by orders of magnitude, especially when you have a language that doesn't support it. But mm-hmm. multi-threaded programs were subject to race conditions where 999 times out of a 1,000, thread A finished its race before thread B, Mm. but one time in 1000 and only on Alice's PC when it's a full moon, thread B finishes first. And if it needed something from thread A to have been completed, you'd end up with a nasty bug. So how can you protect against a bug that fails one in a million times? Right. How can you debug that? Yeah, biology works in similar ways with uh, lots of little homeostatic loops, all depending on some state that's been set by a different loop. And the problem is that you have to look at the system not as a strongly coupled set of gears or water reservoirs and pipes, but you have to look at it as a loosely coupled system with emergent properties. So the malarkey is the idea that you can fix that bug just by buying Alice a new PC or closing the office during a full moon, which... Not a bad idea, actually. (laughs) Well, I would call that some seriously superstitious malarkey. It's kind of like trying to reduce the amount of energy stored by eating less fuel. If the root cause of the problem is that you're inhibited from burning fuel, uh, then it won't help. Likewise, you cannot just use more by exercising more because your body will conspire to reduce the amount of energy it uses on other things. I'll give you an example of a premium low-carb engineer reductio ad absurdum malarkey. <laughs> I'm sorry. I like bullshit better. <laughs> we should have take a, a poll. poll. I think we have a We're poll. We're going to take a poll, definitely. So this malarkey is the idea floating around the low-carb community that you should only eat when your blood glucose goes de- below a certain range. Mm. The oversimplification to the point of absurdity is glucose is fuel, and when you run low on fuel, you need more fuel. 
But blood yeah. glucose isn't a fuel gauge. The ATP to ADP ratio is the actual fuel signal. Blood glucose is more like a check oil light than a fuel gauge. Yeah, so that would be some serious malarkey if you had to wait until your check oil light went on before you could gas your car. <laughs> it's even worse. <laughs> glucose can go up or down when you eat or when you do exercise or when somebody cuts you off in traffic or when you get a flu. The whole idea of eating only Stress. when your glucometer says you may is like deferring to a magic eight ball as your new dietary guru. Can I eat yet? Signs point to no. <laughs> Plus, this kind of orthorexic malarkey is how you develop eating disorders. Well, that that is certainly some malarkey. It's also bullshit. I'm extremely opinionated on that one, by the way, <laughs> on glucose levels. What's in your bloodstream is what is in transit and not yet in use. So, unless, unless you can add together what the incoming and the outbound traffic is, Exactly. Uh, you you absolutely want to have homeostasis and lean mass hyperspawners in particular often have like glucose in the mid 90s to low 100s. And they're like a flat board mm -hmm. there. If you look at their CGM, it hardly moves at all, except when they exercise. So do we really think there's just steadily making the same amount of glucose or do we just think that there's acting on it by the body? I, anyway, I think Dave means we need a semaphore. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, biology has given us a complex system that gives us fueling signals that work best when you can turn fuel into energy, food into ATP. And that signal telling you that now you have plenty of energy can shut off the fuel is low signal. This is why type mm. 2 diabetics, once you reduce insulin's inhibition on transporting fatty acids into the mitochondria to be burned, satiety does the job it's intended to do because you're able to turn fuel into energy. That job of satiety is to integrate all 100% of the inputs, not just 20% of them, to adequately fuel your body. And as Dr. Finney explained to us, fat to satiety in a low insulinogenic context appropriately fixes the broken feedback system. It's complex and complicated, so keep calm and keto on. And that's no malarkey. <laughs> it's also no bullshit. <laughs> Well, Richard, that brings us solidly to this little section that we call Recipes! Recipes! You know, it was funny. My dinner guest today, um, we were hoping that Carrie would show up, but she was busy with some work and she didn't. But, um, but, uh, they were concerned that, you know, there was like this rift between Carl and Carrie. Uh, you know, the, nah. she, he does the recipes thing. She doesn't want to do that. He says chaffles. She says chaffles. chaffles. Right. You know, and I'm like, Oh, come on. No, no yeah. we just do that. <laughs> We're just playing with you. Yeah. Anyway. So Carrie, take it away. Cousin Carl, how are you? Just fine. And, and Mr. Morris, how are Carrie? thou? I, I am fine. Thank you. <laughs> Although his shirt says meh. My shirt says meh. <laughs> meh. My shirt says meh. My face goes, wah. <laughs> <laughs> Wahoo. Wahoo. Well, you seem what? in very fine spirits, sir, I must say. Okay. So what have you got for us? Well, and I have to admit that I was under the misguided impression that custard was a fully British thing. Mm. Ah. And... And I didn't realize that Americans are also, like, wildly fond of custard. When I was a kid, my mother and grandmother both used to make just your basic egg custard with a little bit of coconut shredded on top and brulee, you know, like a creme brulee, but not as rich. They weren't into rich food at all. But so, yeah, I grew up with it. It's actually quite popular in Sweden. Your mum's Swedish, right? She is, yeah. Swedish ancestry. It's a popular meal, like uh, in a smorgasbord table, one of the meals you have is uh, rice pudding and custard. Yeah, and so, she, yeah. one of her favorite dishes growing up um, was pears and custard, poached yes. pears. Yeah, that's also yeah. Swedish, yeah. Very Swedish yeah. with some almonds Yum. on top. Yeah. Well, we're in the mood, so how about some yeah, cold right. jelly and custard there? Now, now we all want <laughs> custard, all right? Custard. Exactly. <laughs> so when I grew up in England, obviously, and we had custard all the time. Now, what I mean, what a Brit means by custard is is like what I think, Cousin Carl, you'll have to correct me, but I think I'm. it's a very thick, what you would call creme anglaise. Yeah, creme anglaise, right. A so sauce. it's it's very thick and it's pourable. It's a it's a hot 
sauce. Yeah. Um, if you've had creme anglaise, it's a lot, lot thicker than that. It's like a thick ice cream base. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and we used to pour this hot on pretty much any dessert, apple crumble, apple pie, like, uh, you know, spotted dick, treacle pudding, all of those things. All You always had a big jug of hot custard to pour over everything. So that's what I mean by custard. So I think, as I say, I think it's different everywhere. And I thought that that was just a British thing, but then I discovered that I was wrong. And I'm always happy to be wrong when it turns out to be a good thing. So the custard that I grew up with, and I think every Brit that ever was born grew up with was Instant custard. It's yes. birds' same custard powder. Yeah, same in Australia. We, it, it was, so the it packaging was hasn't changed in 300 years. It's still, it's like red and blue it's, and yellow package. Nah, sounds yep. disgusting. <laughs> and it's essentially, if you look, it, I, to me, I grew up thinking it was this magical powder that you just add milk to and stir it and it gets thick and it makes a big, a big, jug of steaming custard so it turns out you know i i and, and people were asking me to make a keto version of birds custard and i looked at the ingredients and it's literally flavored corn flour or corn yeah. starch yeah. that's yeah. all it is is flavored uh, corn starch there's like it's no a, it's wallpaper paste it's like wall it's like egg flavored wallpaper paste there's no dehydrated <laughs> egg or anything in it really no, nah, it's yeah. literally flavored Corn starch. Oh my god, that's terrible. <laughs> anyway, we all grew up with that, and of course, that's the the flavor we wanted. Anyway, yeah. I decided that I was going to do something a little bit different. I wasn't going to try and recreate that flavor, but I did need to come up with a pourable custard that you could you could use on your desserts, or just you know eat it. Just eat it yeah. with a spoon. So. The other thing about custard or creme anglaise is that most people are frightened of it. Since they can't have their bird's instant custard, making an egg custard is kind of time-consuming and it can be a bit tricky. It can go wrong. Yeah, if you heat mm -hmm. too high heat and or too long heat, your custard's going to split and there's pretty much no way to recover a split custard. So a lot of people like just do without. If they can't have birds, they're not going to – to, to do the cooked egg custard. So I wanted to come up yeah. with a custard that took three seconds and tasted fabulous and did mm. not require cooking. No or double did boilers. Not require, didn't require double boilers, didn't require cooking the eggs in, in the same way. So I came up with, and this is actually almond custard. Okay, good. So... Here we go. You are going to need five ounces of allulose or xylitol, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you're going to put that in the blender with a quarter of a teaspoon of sea salt, two cups or one pint of almond milk. Does it two have to be hot? Nope. Huh. Nope. Okay. Two teaspoons of almond extract and four eggs. You're going to put that all in a blender. Whole eggs? Whole eggs. <laughs> okay. Everyone's looking at me very strangely yeah, at this yeah. point. <laughs> like, what's she doing? Uh, um, <laughs> sounds, sounds like something Rocky would drink for breakfast. <laughs> you're going to put that all in a blender, and you're going to blend it on low speed until it's completely blended. And then you're going to turn the blender to its lowest speed, and you're going to take that little bit out of the center of the lid. Yep. You're going to turn the blender up just until you start seeing that vortex. Yeah. And then you're going to tap one teaspoon of konjac flour, also known as glucomano powder, through the, the lid and also half a teaspoon of guar gum. And you're going to blend it just for 10 seconds. That's it. No more because guar gum, if you over blend guar gum, you can, that's typically what makes it gluey and nobody ah. wants glue, gluey custard. So okay. 10 seconds on the blending and you're done. Okay. Then you're going to pour your custard into a saucepan and you're going to warm it over a low heat 
stirring it until the custard has thickened. And it's going to, if you know cooking, you'll know what I mean when I say coats the back of your spatula. It's essentially when you mm-hmm. when you put the spatula in and lift it up, it doesn't all just run off. Nappy. Some of it will, will grip the spatula. Yeah. Nappy. Mm-hmm. And then um, once it's thickened, you're going to pour it in a jug. You're going to use it as a hot sauce, or you can pour it into a clean glass container and leave it to cool completely before covering it and storing it in the fridge. You can either use it as a cold sauce or you can just eat it as a dessert or you can use it in other recipes. And that's what we're going to do on the next episode is we're going to use our awesome blender almond custard to create another dessert out of it. Oh, boy, I can't wait. That sounds delish. So that's it. And it literally takes three minutes. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Plus a couple of minutes to warm it up to thicken it. It is super simple. It can't go wrong. You don't have the issue with the eggs because you're not tempering them and yeah. hoping mm-hmm. for the best. Mm. Everything's already blended up and um, and it tastes delicious. And people were very happy, very happy with the almond custard. And we're nice. very happy with you, Carrie Brown. Thank you very much for Thanks, sharing Karen. your you're very your welcome recipe today. Yeah, that's it. All right. Custard. Yay. (laughs) See ya. Thanks. See ya. Thanks, Gary. Hey, thanks for listening. We hope you get as much out of this information as we do in putting it together. You know, Two Keto Dudes doesn't take advertising revenue. Nope. We have no benefactors with hidden agendas. That's right. It's listeners like you who keep our lights on. And you know, there are a few ways you can support us, all of which are listed on our website at twoketodudes.com slash support. Thanks again. And we'll see you next time on Two Keto Dudes. Dudes.